Thank you for watching this message today. We hope it blesses you. Your support of the ministry means so much to us. We encourage you to share this video with your family and friends because it's an easy and simple way to share the gospel. Now let's get into the message. God bless. Father, we thank you so much that you know our name. Lord, you don't, you don't have Alzheimer's. You don't forget things. <laughs> You've not forgotten us. You've carried us through, Lord, especially these last two, three years. And you still know our name. Thank you, Lord, for your faithfulness. We pray today that you would bless your word as it goes forth, that it will accomplish what you want it to do. And you would be glorified in our lives in this new year. We commit this time to you. Grant to us ears to hear, hearts to receive your counsel. Father, while we are praying, I want to lift up those who are victims of the fire in Boulder. We pray, Father, for the families who've lost everything that is temporary. And I pray that it would turn them to that which is eternal. That out of the very ashes, Lord, you, the God who's able to create something beautiful, would do a mighty work. We pray that your peace would sustain those who know you and those who do not know you they will be drawn to your peace we pray that you provide for them Lord materially and spiritually emotionally mentally that they would find that even though the things of the world that we have can be burned up that the things that we have in God are everlasting and they would find an everlasting refuge in Jesus so be with them Lord we pray we lift up these one of our sister churches, Lord, is Calvary Boulder Valley. Many of the members of that congregation have lost everything. We pray, Father, that in the midst of this material loss, again, they remember that in Jesus they have everything. Would you strengthen them, Father, today and be glorified in all of this? We ask it in Jesus' holy name. And everyone said, Amen. Amen. God bless you. Thank you for being here this morning. You may be seated. Uh, I was contacted by a pastor, one of our uh, churches that we're in fellowship with, uh, and um, he informed me of the uh, church in uh, Boulder that we're affiliated with, um, Calvary Boulder Valley, uh, what was going on there. So kind of did an emergency fundraiser, and praise the Lord, with what we were able to give here from our fellowship and other fellowships, they were able to raise $60,000. Uh, for yeah, immediate emergency needs, amen, they're going to use to uh, uh, help those who are in need uh, there uh, in Boulder with the, the church. But also, we're going to have on our website tomorrow um, uh, a link for you to go to to donate food, clothing, whatever the need is, or financially to not just the church, but to all of those, all the people who are impacted by this hor horrendous fire. And so, uh, make sure you if you want to donate, you go there. It should be up, up tomorrow on our website. Amen. Well, blessed new year to all of you. Amen. And I thought about this boulder fire. I thought, Lord, what a uh, you know, great segue into really our message today. Uh, the title of the message is Godly or Godly Intentionality. Amen. Godly Intentionality. And we're, being, we're going to be looking at Psalm 25, verses 12 to 13, but not right now. I'm going to uh, lay kind of the groundwork, if you will, for... For moving forward in this new year, and then we'll look at Psalm 25 to give us some balance of what that looks like uh, spiritually as well. Um, God, the intentionality. The word intentionality, what does it mean? It means simply the quality of, of mental states or your mental status and your thoughts, your beliefs, your desires, your hopes. And Jesus said this concerning this year and every year, really, and, and there are many predictions that are going to be made, and we make our, you know, our New Year's resolutions. You know, how many of us made the resolution when we get in shape? Amen. We, we did last year, too, didn't we? Amen. Uh, but, you know, we make all these resolutions, and there's predictions out there that are starting to come out, and most of them won't come true. But here's, here's a prediction that Jesus made that you can hang your hat on. And he said in John 16, 33, that these things I have spoken to you, that in me you may have peace. In the world you will have tribulation, 
but be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. I've never had anybody refute the fact that every year you will have tribulation. Oh, not me, Pastor. (laughs) Smooth sailing. (laughs) All of us will have tribulation of some sort. But remember the context. In me, you will have peace. In the world, you will have tribulation. It really matters where we're, what we're in, amen? If we're in Christ, we may have tribulation, but Jesus said, be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. So just as it's guaranteed that we'll have tribulation, it's even guaranteed, and Jesus predicted in every year, he offers to us his peace, amen? And there are two words there in um, John 16, that I want to point out that are important, and that is the word peace, of course, and then the word overcome that Jesus uses used there. And uh, because the Greek word for peace, uh, irene, it can be, uh, means rather, I should say, security or prosperity. God wants us to walk in security and prosperity in him in this new year. And the Greek word for overcome is nikao or nikao, and it's uh, similar to the Greek word Nike. We're familiar with the brand Nike. Well, it's a Greek word which means to conquer, to be victorious, and I love this one, one who wins the case. (laughs) <laughs> whatever case the devil has planned against you in 2022, Jesus has already gone before you and has overcome it. Amen? We don't know what's ahead of us. It's a new year and all, but whatever case the enemy may try to bring against you, Jesus, we can overcome it through faith in Jesus Christ. He, in fact, he's gone before us to make sure that we overcome. In other words, let us enter this new year with a certain demeanor, a victorious demeanor, not that of victims, not running into the new year with our tails between our legs and going, Phew, you know, 2021, that was close, you know. But walking in victory. Super Bowl champions do not act like chumps. God has called us to be champions. Back in 97, 98, thereabouts, both of those years, the Broncos had back-to-back Super Bowl wins. I'm just saying. And um, I had, someone gave me some tickets uh, to go to a, uh, a Denver Nuggets game at the old McNichols Arena. And uh, nobody was watching the Broncos back, I mean, uh, the Nuggets back then. <laughs> I think there were like 25 people at the game. No, it's more than that. But, but uh, you know, we went there, and it was like a preseason game or whatever, but I thought, hey, dad, son, sign out. We're going to go out and have a good time. And while we were there, long story short, he, uh, you know, God bless us. You know, we got some seats down by the court and, and all. And I noticed behind me, you know, some little commotion. And there's two guys sitting back there. And they just, they just look like studs. You know, they're just like, these guys are doing something. I don't know what they're doing, but they're doing something, you know. And uh, turns out it was one of the guys was uh, Steve Atwater from the Broncos. They had just won the Super Bowl. And he was, he was, he was, his, his demeanor was that of a champion, not a chump. He was sitting back there, just an imposing figure of a man. I mean, it was like, you know, so I thought, well, man, if he could just get signatures from him for my voice, T-shirts, that would be great. And, uh, you know, so I went up to him. I said, uh, Mr. Atwater, <coughs> Mr. put some bass in your voice, boy. <laughs> Say it with your chest, amen. Uh, Mr. Mr. Atwater, can you uh, sign my son's uh, T-shirts? Would you mind doing that? Oh, sure, you know. So he signs a T-shirt, Steve Atwater. I thought, oh, man, what an evening. This is, is, you know, this must be from God, you know. (laughs) And we had this great evening with my sons, and we got the signature from this guy. Had no idea in 2020 he'd be inducted in the Pro Football Hall of Fame. Amen. So I'm like, wow, man, this is is great. Get home, you know, everybody's real excited, telling the wife about it and stuff. And the next day I'm like, hey, where's the boys' T-shirts? It hurts me to talk about this. <laughs> what do you mean? I washed them. That was my retirement. <laughs> no. And, and I told my wife I would share the whole story. I put the T-shirts in the dirty clothes hamper. So it's naturally, men, my fault. <laughs> amen. My wife says, amen. 
So anyway, what's the point of the, the whole the, the story here? I just had to get it off my chest. Anyway, back to the message. <laughs> no, really, the point is his demeanor was that of a champion, and God wants us to go forward in this new year with the demeanor of a Super Bowl champion because Jesus has won the Super Bowl. It's not what we've done, what he's already done for us. Therefore, we can go forth as victors rather than victims. What's your demeanor like this morning? You running from something or are you running to something? You're running to Jesus. Our victory is in him. Now, how can we live with godly intentionality? Because Steve Atwater was intentional about winning the Super Bowl. He worked out. He did whatever he did. And when he hit people in the, on defense, amen, he did it intentionally. <laughs> there was some intentionality. When he knocks some folks out, amen? <laughs> we have to be intentional. And how do we do that as believers? Well, one way is by having a personal vision, plans, goals for our life. Now, I want to talk to you about this. This is, you know, I'm not trying to be, you know, some motivational speaker. Kind of, that's not what I do. I preach the word. But I believe God wants us to have a personal vision for our lives some direction for our lives, and we'll see why, uh, even from the scriptures. Is uh, the famous uh, American author, salesman, he's a motivational speaker, Zig Ziglar once said this, if you, can, if you aim at nothing, you will hit it every time. And sometimes we come into a new year and go, wow, phew, got through the next, and we don't know where we're going with the new year. And I want to challenge you. This is the message I mean to challenge you uh, to have, you know, a guide, a direction for your life. Now, there's some things that, that I've written down that work for me. This is, I'm not, this is just for me. I don't believe in just reading something from a book and telling you to do it, and then I don't do it. Uh, but this is what I'm applying to my life. It's really simple. Not the best you've ever heard. There's great books out there on how to make plans for your life and all this. But this works for me, and I want to just share it with you guys uh, this morning. The first thing I think you need to do in order to have a personal vision for your life, to set plans and goals, is to write down a guiding statement for your life for the new year. I challenge you to do that. Sit down and write out in one sentence a guiding statement for your life this year, you know, with a supporting scripture, I might add. Here's mine for this year, and, and it, it could vary. It may, I may fluctuate throughout the year, but Starting out, I, my first thing I want to do is not, is not on the screen, but is basically I wrote down, slow down, explore new avenues of ministry specific to my gift setting, the gifts that God has given me. Now, that's for me. That means a lot to me. I know the background behind that. So that's my kind of my, my uh, uh, guiding statement, if you will, and uh, my Supporting scripture is Isaiah chapter 42, verse 9. Behold, the former things have come to pass, and new things I declare before they spring forth. I tell you of them. So God is, in my life, is saying, you know, there's some former things you prayed about that I've accomplished for you, but I want to show you some new things. Amen. Now, that's mine. So don't steal it. Anyway, <laughs> no, you can borrow it if you want. But the second thing I need to do is if I'm going to have a personal vision for my life and goals is to write down what I call developmental or task-oriented goals, things that you really want to do. Uh, it could be I want to, always want to learn Spanish. Well, then you write that down. I want to learn, I want to learn Spanish, learn how to speak Spanish this year. Uh, one of my goals I've been trying to get after the last two, over two years is clean up and organize my garage. Now you may say, but that's pretty shallow, but it's important to me. You know, it's just one of those things I've been wanting to get, get to and haven't been able to get to. And so it's just, it's a task-oriented goal. Now, this doesn't have to be just one task or one developmental thing you do. It could be multiple, but I'm just writing this down just for the sake of, uh, uh, of an example. Uh, the, the third thing is to write down a fun goal, a fun goal. And, you know, we, we lived in kind of oppression for the last three years with COVID and, you know, Omicron and you know, Billy Bomb and everything else. I don't know what's going on. It's, what's the na next thing, you know? And everybody's living oppressed and fear. Man, I believe God. The Bible says joy of the Lord is my strength. Amen. It's like this joy has been sucked out of the world. Amen. But it shouldn't be sucked out of believers. 
We should still have joy. And I believe God wants us to have goals for fun. And what do I mean by that? You know, example, it could be a fun vacation. You, hey, my wife and I always wanted to go to Paris. Well, you start planning for that. You know, you've got you to start planning for that. Uh, you know, or it could be the fact that you have these periodic times, once a week or a month, that you do this certain thing you really enjoy doing, having fun doing it. Or it could be seasonal, it could be hunting, whatever. You know, just fill in the blank. But do something that's fun. I believe we need to laugh more. The Bible says that laughter is good medicine for the soul. Amen? And uh, sometimes we come to church sometimes and, you know, it's like, you know, I, I love the Lord. Well, notify your face because it's like... <laughs> It's like you look like you're sucking on prunes or something, you know what I mean? Just, or, you know, lemons or what have you, you know, just, you know, God wants the joy of the Lord is my strength, amen? Enjoy what God has given you. Can you say amen to that, amen? We all need to laugh a little bit more, amen? We all need to enjoy life a little bit more. Now, note something, something that's really important, because if we can all talk about, you know, I've I want to plan to have more fun. I want hey, this type of thing or learn Spanish or clean the garage. But it's always, some of us, our goals get marooned, I call it, <laughs> marooned on the island of someday isle. What island is that? Isle, I-S-L-E, you know, or, or an island. Someday isle. Someday isle. And we're always saying someday isle. You'll never do it. Your goals and your plans will be maroon if you do not measure them. In other words, if you want to go on vacation to Paris, you better start putting some money away every month. That's a plan. And then you also put a date and a time on it. So I want to clean up the garage, okay? I just need to start. I need to put a date and time on it. I need to set aside some of my vacation or whatever to be out there for a week digging through all the junk or whatever, you know. But you've got to put a date and time on it or you will be at the end of the next this year You'll be saying, someday I'll, and that day will never come. you got to measure it. Amen? Or we'll be marooned. Our plans will be marooned. And I believe God wants us to have plans. I think God wants us to accomplish things. I, want, I believe God wants us to enjoy life. But we have to be intentional. Without intentionality, we are prone to wander and waste the gift of time God has given us. The Bible says it this way in Proverbs 29, uh, I think 29, verse 18, get my eyes adjusted here. It says, where there is no vision, the people perish, but he that keepeth the law, that is God's word, happy is he. Now, that's the old King James Version. In the new King James Version, it says that he, where there is no revelation, that the people cast off restraint. I thought that's interesting. What's it saying there is basically that if you have no revelation, no plan for your life, <laughs> no direction for your life, you will cast off restraint and you will end up wasting your life. An unplanned, uh, if you will, or unrest I should, unrestrained life in Christ will turn out to be an unfruitful life. You show me a believer who's unfruitful, I'll show you somebody who doesn't, who's living an unrestrained life. They don't know which direction they're going, they just going with the wind. God wants us to have direction for our life. Ephesians chapter 5 tells us, see then that you walk carefully, that is circumspectly, but it means carefully, not as fools, not as, but as wise, redeeming the time because the days are evil. The devil wants you to waste this next year. God wants you to be prosperous in this year, but we have to have direction godly intentionality you know is important but there's like a three-legged stool that supports our godly intentionality that we also have to have with our in, incorporated in our plans that i want to share with you as well that gives really balance to godly intentionality because it's not like you know i can just write something down and it's just presto it's just going to happen this year uh we we have to have support to those plans uh, a a, a uh, guidance system, if you will, for our plans. And we find them here. This will return to Psalm 25, verses 12 and 13. And I find them there in Psalm 25, verse 12 in particular. And we have to have the fear of the Lord. That's one leg of the three-legged stool that supports our plans and our vision. We also have to have the teaching of the Lord. That's the second leg. 
And the third leg is we have, the, have to have the direction of the Lord. And so I want to talk to you about those three things. I call them FTD, amen? Can you remember that this year, FTD? That's the floral company, amen? If you want a blossoming, a, a, a beautiful year, then remember the fear of the Lord, the teaching of the Lord, and the direction of the Lord. Amen? Come on now, y'all be saying amen. I worked on that a hard, long time. Amen? <laughs> no, I'm kidding. <laughs> But it's so important. And look at what Psalm 25 says. Amen. Psalm 25, verse 12. In fact, the whole psalm is a great psalm. If you want to just say, hey, I want to read a chapter, start out my new year, that, that's a great chapter to read. But he says here that who is the man or the woman that fears the Lord? Him or her shall, be, shall he teach, that is God will teach, in the way, and check this out, he chooses way God chooses interesting then it says in verse 13 that he himself shall walk or she shall walk or shall dwell rather in prosperity and his descendants shall inherit the earth wow so let's look at this these this three-legged stool the fear of the Lord the teaching of the Lord and the direction of the Lord that accompany our plans for the new year and they're important for us to remember uh, uh, as we plan things for our, our year, as we look forward in the new year. The first thing is the fear of the Lord. Now, this is, again, reverential fear. This is not trembling in my boots and God's going to hit me in the head any moment. Uh, this is reverential fear, fear that is born, if you will, out of love. Uh, we live in an age where there is no fear of God. There is no fear of God in the eyes of the people in our world today, people Fain, they fake like they know about God. Let's have a moment of silence. And I wonder, you know, who they're praying to. But people really have no fear of God. I was reading an article by the, uh, <laughs> they're calling him the rooftop pastor, but Pastor Corey uh, there in, on the south side of Chicago, I've mentioned him before, um, who has, uh, you know, pitched this uh, little makeshift tent or whatever on top of this roof uh, and believing God to raise funds. Uh, for building a community center there on the south side of Chicago to help the plight of the people in that community. And he's on day, I think it's day 43 now. He's going to be there for 100 days. And uh, I believe God's going to bless him to be able to build that, that uh, facility. But in an article I was reading that, in a, uh, uh, that he had uh, featured or featured about him, uh, they were talking about nihilism. He said, we live in an age of nihilism. And what is nihilism? It's the rejection of all religious and moral principles in the belief that life is meaningless. That sounds just like the devil. Life is meaningless. Life without meaning. And we wonder why, you know, most young men in the, in the inner cities and all, uh, most young men do not believe that they're going to live beyond the age of 21. It's called nihilism. They have no reason to, to live on, no reason to respect uh, authority, no reason to fear God. I'm not going to see 22 anyway. And so we see it at home and we see this violence on television. We go, oh, this is out of control and I can't believe people are doing this. Well, when you don't have anything to live for, it's easy for them, someone, them, them to walk up and take what you have, your car, your life. So they can get theirs and get what they need out of this world before they reach 21. It's nihilism. It's dark out there. But thank God for the light, for the hope of the gospel. Thank God for pastors like Pastor Corey and others who are working in those places, holding up the light of the gospel in those inner cities. Amen? But for the believer, our lives should be the antithesis of nihilism, the total opposite of nihilism, that we should fear the Lord. I'm looking forward in this new year, and without the fear of the Lord, you're already heading in the wrong direction. The Bible tells us in Psalm 111 that the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, a good understanding of all those who do his commandments, that is, keep his word. His praise endures forever. Amen? The fear of the Lord. The reverence of the Lord that we should have for the Lord gives good understanding about the direction that we're going. When we make our plans, our plans must be made according to the, out of the fear of the Lord. That we're not doing something that's going to offend God or what have you. 
They honor God. Now we talk about, again, reverence of the Lord, fear of the Lord, not talking about shaking in your boots, but we're talking about fear born out of a love for the Lord. I revere my wife, you know. Not because my wife's going to jack me up. <laughs> I revere my wife out of love for my wife. If I love her, I'll respect her. You show me a man doesn't respect his wife, I'll show you a man doesn't love his wife. And, and, and wives, vice versa. You know, you, you revere your husband out of love for your husband. We revere God out of love for God. Jesus said, if you love me, you'll obey me. Amen? And when we love God, man, the sky's the limit for what we can plan in the direction that, you know, we can, or, or the, the, the goals that we may have in our life, really. I love what uh, St. Augustine said. It's attributed to St. Augustine, but I've heard this many times before, and, and it really is a, a great quote. And uh, he said, love God and do whatever you please. For the soul trained to love God will do nothing to offend the one who is beloved. Close quote. Love God and do whatever you please. Because if I love God, I'm not going to have a goal or a task or anything else that would be offensive to him. So dream. Set your goals, but set them upon the fear of the Lord. Fearing God by loving God is key to godly intentionality. Here's the second thing, and that is the teaching of the Lord. So the man who fears God is taught by the Lord. Show me a man that is unwilling to be taught by the Lord, I'll show you somebody who doesn't fear God. You've been going to counseling for 18 weeks, and you just go, well, I don't know. Even though the pastor or the counselor says, you know, here's what the Word of God says, and you go, well, I'll take that under advisement. No. Once you know what God's Word says, the only reaction we ought to have to that is obedience. Amen? And someone who was just, you know, playing with God, you know, uh, they're not willing to be taught by the Lord. But the one who fears the Lord will also be taught by the Lord. You know, 2021 was a lot of lessons we had to learn. I mean, this time last year, I wasn't even here. I was still recovering from coming out of the hospital with COVID and all. And it was a lot of lessons in 2021 and, and, uh, that you have learned and stuff. But none of us arrived. We're still learning, right? Is God still teaching us? Of course he is. He's still teaching us. Somebody said, and I like this quote, that the largest room in the world is the room for improvement. Husbands, you have not arrived. Wives, you have not arrived. Brothers and sisters in Christ, you have not arrived. There are th things God still wants to teach us. And those who fear the Lord, again, will be taught by the Lord. Now, in order to be taught by the Lord, I have to, be, I have to walk in humility. I have to humble myself to be taught by the Lord. I can't submit my plans to the Lord and say, Lord, this is what I want to do, and you better do it. No, I need to humble myself. Lord, teach me. I'm still teachable. An example of the opposite of humility and a planning or, or prideful planning, if you will, can be found in James chapter 4. James chapter 4, verses 1 to 6. You can turn there and read along with me, but uh, I'm going to read it quickly here for time's sake. Please listen carefully. And James gives us a reason for some of the contention in maybe your marriages or in relationships. James says it this way, excuse me. <coughs> So where do wars and fights come from among you? And he's writing here to believers. Do they not come from your desires for pleasure that war in your members, in your body? You lust and do not have. You murder and covet and cannot obtain. Now, when he's talking about murder, he's not about, you know, just busting a cap in somebody. He's talking about, you know, even hating your brother or sister in Christ. Jesus said, if you hate your brother, you committed murder. Amen? He says, where does all this stuff come from? You lust and you do not have. You murder uh, and covet and cannot obtain. You, you fight and you war, yet you do not have because you do not ask. You do not ask as a, you, you ask and do not receive because you, do, because you ask amiss that you may spend it on your pleasures. In other words, that you might... I think the old King James says, you may heap it upon your own lust. 
In other words, it, I'm the idol of my life, and it's about what I want and what my will is, not God's. James calls us out, called the church out. He said, you adulterers and adulteresses, do you not know that friendship with the world is enmity, hostility with God? Whoever, therefore, wants to be a friend of God, a friend, rather, of the world, makes himself an enemy of God. Or do you think that the Scripture says, in vain, the Spirit who dwells in us yearns jealously? The Lord is not going to sublet one iota of your life to the devil in 2022. He is not going to give the devil any room in your life. He's a jealous God. He wants all of you. Amen? Then James goes on to say, but he gives, verse 6 of James chapter 4, but he gives more grace. Therefore, he says, God resists the proud, the plans of the proud, but gives grace to the humble. Amen? So you don't want to be, have prideful planning. Lord, you've got to do what I tell you to do. And, and, and just making plans, you as the center of the plan, and it's all just about you. But you want to submit that plan to the Lord, to the teaching of the Lord, and say, God, you know, teach me. Because here's the reason why I say that is because, number one, we don't want to be, full of, be prideful about what we plan. And we'll see that, why that's important a little bit later here. But uh, the other thing is, that God has a way of interrupting our plans. Amen? Has God ever inter- interrupted one of your plans? Amen? You're just planning stuff. I always laugh because I think in 2019, every pastor at New Year's, or New Year's Eve message or New Year's Day message was 2020 vision for 2020. Yeah! Woo! Nobody saw COVID coming. Men make their plans. Amen? God will interrupt our plans. You know, God has the audacity to interrupt our plans. God has the audacity in my life to act like God. I can't believe it. But he does that many times. He will interrupt our plans. Amen. But God's interruptions are merely opportunities for instruction. His interruptions are opportunities for instruction. Psalm 25 says, Show me your ways, O Lord. Teach me your paths. Lead me in your truth. And teach me, for you are the God of my salvation. On you I wait all the day. Two times, teach me, Lord. Teach me your path. Teach me. I can make my plans, but God has audacity sometimes to interrupt my plans. And then he calls me to wait upon him. The second leg of that three-legged stool is that I need to be taught by the Lord and be willing to be taught by God. Willing to wait upon him, even though I have established my goals. I rest them on the fact that God is still teaching me something. Amen. When we wait on the Lord, waiting on the Lord teaches us three things. Number one, it teaches us to trust in God's timing. The Apostle Paul had a bucket list, you know that. In his bucket list, he wanted to go to Rome. He finally got to Rome, but not according to his timing, but God's timing. He didn't think that, you know, Lord, I want to go to Rome. God could have just sent him to Rome. He could have gotten there easily, but he didn't know he had to go through imprisonment and a shipwreck before he got to Rome in God's timing. So we can say, God, this is my goal, this is what I want to do, but we also have to yield to his timing. Because in his timing, he's teaching. He's teaching us. He's teaching us to trust in his timing. He's teaching us, secondly, to rest in his word and not our way. That my rest comes in the fact that, Lord, I'm resting in your word and not because things are going my way. The, number, the third thing he teaches us as we're going through a difficult time is to delight in the Lord. We say, oh, I want to delight in the Lord. Then God will send you many times tribulation so you, he can teach you how to delight in the Lord when everything around you is going crazy. Some of you know what I'm talking about. 
Oh, Lord, help me to be patient. Oh, he'll send you somebody in your life that'll rub you the wrong way every day. Called a spouse. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> you want to learn patience? He'll teach you. You want to learn how to delight in the Lord? He'll probably take a lot of things from you. But all you have is the Lord. One thing to say, Jesus is all I need, is something else to say, Jesus is all I've got. There's a lot of people in Boulder right now saying, Jesus is all we got. And God would teach us how to do to delight in the Lord. And that's what waiting on the Lord teaches us, teaches me to wait. Lord, I delight in you. The Bible tells us in Psalm uh, 37, it says, delight yourself in the Lord, and he will give you the desires of your heart. Here's what we do with that scripture. It's a wonderful scripture, but we put the desires of our heart before the Lord. And we wonder why we're miserable, because you haven't given this to me yet. Yeah, but where have you put me? Behind what you delight in. But I should be your delight. And when you delight in me, what you want follows. Amen? Delight in the Lord and he will give you the desires of your heart. So, three-legged stool. First leg is fear of the Lord. Second leg is, Lord, I remain teachable. It's my plans, but Lord, I need to fear you. I need to remain teachable. because You might interrupt my plans. And the third thing element, if you will, excuse me, of faith related to our personal vision, that's the context, is the direction of the Lord. In verse 12, the latter part of verse 12 in uh, Psalm 25, it says that he will, the person who fears the Lord, he will teach them and he will lead them the way that he, that is God, chooses. You see, we think we're in control of our lives. You know, people say, you know, I'm the captain of my own ship. No, you're not. As believers, we're not the captain of our own ship. You know, we're, we're the child sitting in the child seat with the plastic steering wheel, and we think we're driving the car, and mom and dad's up there, oh, boy, here you are. I'm turning. <laughs> yeah, you know. We just, you know, you're not doing it. You're just this little toddler back there, yeah, you know, hitting the little bumper thing, trying to blow the horn. You know, that's what we are. You're not the captain of your own ship, amen? We belong to the Lord. And he guides us in the way that he chooses because he has a better perspective than we have. The Bible says in Proverbs 15, or 16, amen, get a little closer, that a man's heart plans his own way, but the Lord directs his steps. This is the third leg of that stool that we place our plans and our dreams and our goals upon. God, here's my plans, but direct my steps. It's been said, if you want to make God laugh, tell him your plans, right? There's nothing wrong in having plans. I mean, and this is why it's important, because well, why should I come up with a plan? God's going to do what he wants to do. Hey, it's easier to guide a moving car than one in neutral. And God wants to see our faith. So I plan, I make plans by faith, but I yield those plans to a three-legged stool, the fear of the Lord. The teaching of the Lord and the direction of the Lord. Lord, I commit them to you. It shouldn't be a discouragement to us that God, you know, that when we say who God, you want to make God laugh, you know, show him your plans or tell him your plans. It shouldn't make, discourage us. It should uh, encourage us because God's plans is always greater than mine. My, my plans are limited to what I can see. God sees from the perspective of eternity. Look at verse 13 here in uh, Psalm 25 where he says that he, or, or he himself, verse 13 says, shall, shall dwell in prosperity and his descendants shall inherit the earth. It's, it's like, you know, Lord's saying this is, all you can see right now is today, I see your descendants. We're looking from the perspective of what we see today. God says, I see your great, great, great grandchildren. I wonder who prayed for me before they even knew anything about me or they never got to know me or anything. But I believe that I have descendants or ancestors who have prayed for me. And that's part of the reason why I'm here today. I know it's God's will, but who, someone, someone prayed for you. Sometimes you're looking at family tree, and there's that pastor, you know. Like, oh, I know we had a pastor in our 
family tree, you know, five, six, you know, five generations ago or whatever, you know, two generations ago, your great grandfather, what have you. And what God was doing in their life, enabling them to walk by faith, God was doing it for our sake. And what God is doing in, for, in your life right now, you can't see past tomorrow. You go, I don't know, I'm going to make it. He's going to give you the strength to make it. You're going to have a testimony that's going to touch descendants, those who will come after you tomorrow. God's always looking beyond what we can see. And so I don't understand what he's doing right now, but what he tells me is to trust him. To trust him. Are you trusting the Lord today? I had no idea what God was going to do when Norm and I, we had no idea what he was going to do when we came up here to pastor this church, but I remember, and I've told the story before, but, you know, I'm running out of illustrations. I'm getting older. Amen. <coughs> Excuse me. But, uh, you know, before we came up here, I remember telling the Lord, Lord, if you would just give me 12 people that I could just teach the word to and just, just pour your word into it and, and the experiences that you've given to me, if I could just have 12 people, Lord, I'd be the richest, happiest man in the world. And God said, you're aiming too low. He always does above and beyond what we could ask or think. That's why I say when God interrupts my plans, it means that he has a greater plan, maybe even one that I can't see. But his intention is not to hurt us, but to glorify his name. And it's for our good. Amen? Romans 8.28 tells us that. Understand this. God is not our co-pilot. You know, you've, you've seen this bumper stickers that used to be around. God is my co-pilot. No, he's not your co-pilot. He's the pilot. Amen. He's the pilot. He's leading and he's guiding us. To be arrogant and to say, well, you know what? I'm going to do this next year and I'm going to do it. Or God, here's my plans. I'm going to speak it into existence. God, you've got to do this. Is arrogance. And James warns against this. He says, don't say this, that you're boasting about what you're going to do tomorrow and all, and it's got to happen and all that. He said, don't do that. He said, rather, in James chapter 4, he says, instead, you ought to say, if the Lord wills, we shall live and do this or that. But now you boast in your arrogance. All such boasting is evil. Because all such boasting is not yielded to the Lord. You make your plans. Yes, yeah, it's easier to guide a moving vehicle than one in the neutral. Make your plans, but submit them to the three-legged stool, to the fear of the Lord, the teaching of the Lord, and to the direction of the Lord, because he will lead and guide us in the way that he chooses. And God's flight plan for us <laughs> is always better than ours. Jeremiah 29, 11 to 13. Many of you know it. This is God's plans for 2022 for you. He said, I know the thoughts that I think toward you, says the Lord. Thoughts of peace and not of evil to give you a future and a hope. Then you will call upon me and go and pray to me, and I will listen to you, and you will seek me and find me when you search for me with all of your heart. Our goal, the goals that we have, God wants to prosper you. God's goal this year for you is that you search for him with all of your heart. In conclusion... Let us move forward in the new year with godly intentionality accompanied by the fear, teaching, and the direction of the Lord, trusting in him. Yeah, we, we're going to have tribulation, but behold, we will also have peace as a guarantee because Jesus Christ has overcome the world. Psalm 65, and I will close with this. Before we go into our time of communion, speaking of this year that is before us now, this is what God has prepared for us in this year that is coming. Despite the tribulation and things that might happen, despite maybe some of the interruptions in your plans and all, the Bible says this, that God crowns the year with goodness. You crown the year with your goodness and your paths drip with abundance. They drop on the pastures of the wilderness. So you've been in a wilderness, but God says, I got abundance for that. And the little hills rejoice on every side. The cross of Jesus Christ stands as a constant testament 
of God's faithfulness and God's blessing for you in this new year. His prosperity, that is his peace and his security, and also his victory. Have a blessed new year in the Lord. Amen. Father, we thank you for your word, for your truth, for your goodness, for your faithfulness that we have experienced in all of 2021. We know that you will be with us, and you've gone before us even so in 2022. And maybe somebody here today, you are watching online, you have never given your life to Jesus Christ. You don't know for certain if you're to die today that you go to heaven. And I'm here to ask you to open your heart to the Lord for the first time. Start out this new year the right way by surrendering your life to Jesus Christ. That you may know that your sins are forever forgiven. That you may go forward in a path that drips with abundance. Didn't say it would be a smooth path or you never have problems, but you won't be traveling alone. That God will be with you. God will bless you. And God will keep you despite what comes against you. If you don't know you're on your way to heaven today, you're on the wrong path. Get on the right path. One that drips with abundance rather than one that drips with disappointment, frustration, sin, and death. Say, Pastor Al, I want to get on the right path this year. I want to give my life to Christ. Would you repeat this prayer after me today? Would you open your heart to the Lord today? And repeat after me. Bow your head where you are, right there at home, wherever you are, sitting in bed or sitting at the table or whatever. Pray this prayer. In this building today, you're upstairs in the overflow, you're here in the auditorium. Bow your head and say, Lord Jesus, I believe you are the Son of God. I believe you died for my sins. And I believe that you are risen from the dead. Forgive me for all of my sins. Come into my life and change me. I receive you today into my life as my Lord and as my Savior. In Jesus' name, amen. Again, thank you for watching and supporting the ministry today. If you'd like to support CWC financially, you can go to cwccs.org slash give or click the link in the bio. You can also give on our app. Just go to your app store and search CWCCS or you can text give to 719-354-2778. Also, make sure you check out our merch. The link is in the description. We have Pastor Al's books, t-shirts, CDs, and more. If you're watching on YouTube, make sure you like and subscribe so you don't miss future videos. You can watch the sermons live. We live stream every Sunday at 10 a.m. on our app or our website at cwccs.org. We pray the rest of your day is richly blessed. God bless.